Hey, Springs Community Church, everybody watching online. As we shared before, if this is your first time with us or you've been coming for a long time, we are so glad that you guys are gathering. Guys, I want to let you know, before we jump into the text of where we're going to be today, just an update on where we are in response to COVID-19. Now, as many of you have obviously seen, things in Texas are starting to reopen. So with that, we want to do our best to communicate to you guys. What does that mean for our physical gatherings here at the Springs? I want to give you guys first a high-level overview that myself, the trustees, the way we're thinking about it, and the way we've really been influenced by a medical advisory team, a group of members in our body that are part of the medical community that want to do a great job counseling and advising us on your behalf as well as ours on how best we can go about it. Here's what we know. We know that we need to follow the guidance of national experts, state, national, and local officials, as well as just the wisdom of God. And that's what we're trying to do. We're, we're basically breaking this down into reopening and physical gatherings in really three phases. We're going to prioritize really what we value at this point. The first thing we're looking at is how do you allow, how do you encourage, how do you welcome community groups to physically gather? That's going to be our first goal. The second thing we're looking at is how do we open up some of our midweek discipleship ministries? The reason we're going in this order is because there's smaller physical gatherings where you have a better job encouraging and managing social distancing from both community group level as well as then midweek ministries that are obviously smaller than if we were to start gathering Sunday mornings. After we look at community groups and then midweek, the next one will be our Sunday gathering. We do not yet have a timeline on our Sunday gathering, but here's what I want you to hear. We cannot wait to physically gather and worship the creator of the heavens and the earth with you guys. But as we do that, we want to balance that with wisdom and faithfulness and heeding direction. So for this next week, the main thing we want to let you know about is that community groups, as you guys know, even from legislation, you guys are welcome to physically gather. Now, as we say that you're welcome to physically gather, what that doesn't mean is that we are telling you to or we're telling you not to. We envision a lot of community groups, you will have individual members that will say, hey, I want to gather physically. We can socially distance. We can be outside. There's no one in our group that is particularly at risk. The, the government's encouraging if you're over the age of 65 to continue to worship and to gather virtually. But if you fall within those guidelines that have been outlined and you want to physically gather, you have that freedom. But we think a lot of community groups now, there will be folks who want to physically gather and those who say, hey, I still, not because I'm living in fear, not because I'm living in paranoia, I'm not quite ready. So what we think that looks like is we have the opportunity here at the Springs, as Romans 12 says, to show honor to one another, to show preference, to respect the fact individuals seeking to protect their family, love their neighbor, will land in different areas based on their conscience. So what that'll look like is a lot of community groups, perhaps some will gather physically and some will uh, continue to gather virtually. And then I imagine some, they might have members of the group that say, hey, we'll gather and then we will virtually gather with, we will Skype in, FaceTime in the other members of our groups. If you're confused about what you and your group want to do, we encourage you community group leaders to reach out, to start this discussion. You should have received an email from us kind of outlining a plan, but if we can help you in any way, please don't hesitate to reach out. Right below, you'll see the phone number for Jonathan Dennis. If you have questions about you, your community group, we would love to help answer. That's just a quick COVID-19 update. Will we open up midweek ministries? Will we open up Sunday? Yes, we will. When exactly? That's the part where we don't want to make haste with our feet. We're going to wait, look at the data, listen to expertise, and continue to see. But we promise to keep you informed and updated as we go. But with that update, guys, let me pray for the time because I'm so excited to where we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 1. We're just going to look at two verses. They're beautiful. I can't wait to jump in. Jesus, I thank you for the time. I thank you for the fact we get to gather. I thank you for technology. I thank you that folks are sitting comfortably on couches in homes, reflecting with families, intergenerationally, caring for one another with roommates, watching on tablets and phones, all with a hope and a heart. God, would you help us to love you more? Lord, I pray for the people who are watching. Would you grow in them a love for you? Lord, I pray for people who are watching who, who don't know you, who are wrestling with faith, or who perhaps think they know you, but honestly, they don't. They don't like you. They don't follow you, and there's just confusion. Would you give clarity? Would you lead people to an eternal relationship with you? 
It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Guys, so excited to be with you. Uh, before we jump into the passage, there's a story I want to remind you guys of, or I want to share with you, excuse me, that I think really sets this up. So I grew up in uh, South Florida. I lived there till I was five, and then I moved to Georgia. One of the things that was true of South Florida, we were right near the ocean, and we, we were part of this um, group. I, don't, I honestly don't know what to call it. It's kind of like a Florida version of a country club, I guess, but there was no golf. It was called the Ocean Club. It was a really nice pool with a diving well with like a food bar, and then you could go to the ocean. Even from a young age, I remember it. Growing up, was always swimming. We were playing in the water. It was just part, a part of my childhood. There was this one part at Ocean Club that I always wanted to be a part of, but I was fearful and I was scared, right? I was a kid and it was the diving well. They had two diving boards. There was a smaller kind of three foot diving board. And then there was the 10 foot, almost like diving platform. There was this deep diving well. It went down 12 feet. There was this grate down at the bottom like they all have. And I can remember growing up, watching my dad, watching my mom, watching others at the pool, watching my sister, go off the diving board. I can remember them swimming in the deep end. I can remember them diving down to the bottom. And there I am. I'm this kid. I want to do the same thing, but I was scared. You know what scared me? You might think, well, hey, going off a 10 foot high dive, you could hurt yourself. That's scary. It might be, hey, you're under five. You're still swimming, you know, swimming in the deep end. You can't touch the bottom. That might be scary. No, no, no. None of that scared me. I was able to do all of that. The thing that scared me was I thought the water was so deep that at the bottom, and I'm not saying this is right, but at the bottom, you know the, the grate that's at the bottom of a pool, especially like a public one that's large like that, the grate at the bottom? I thought that there were sharks on the other side of that grate. And because there were sharks, I was terrified to jump off and I was terrified to dive down to the bottom. I can remember there was eventually a day where I worked up the courage where it was, man, everyone else is having so much fun. I'm missing out. They seem to be going off. Everyone's fine. There hasn't been a single shark attack in this chlorinated pool that I said, I'm going off the high dive. I can remember doing it. I don't think it was anything miraculous. I think I just survived and it was fine. I can remember though, it was a ton of fun. It was a rush. Like you're a kid, so 10 feet, it just feels monstrous already. I can remember then also, going and you're holding on to the side of the pool, you know, because it's the deep end and there wasn't anyone jumping. And I can remember thinking, I'm going to dive down to the bottom. The older kids did it. It was kind of the cool thing. I'm going to dive down and I'm going to touch the grate. And the whole time I'm terrified, hoping that grate can hold back the sharks. Now, kids, if, if you're watching, there are not sharks in your chlorinated pool. You're going to be fine. But my fearfulness, my timidity at that point said, all right, I don't want to do it. But I wanted that experience. Everyone else was doing it. I knew I was missing out. And there came this point, I am diving down. Guys, you know how the story ends, man. I go down, I touch it. I realize there's no sharks yet. I still have this irrational fear. I swam super fast back up to the top, but I realized, oh, I did it. But I can remember thinking back on how fun that was. Like there was this fear in me to first go off the high dive. This fear in me to dive down to the bottom. But once I was able to push through that, I legitimately had more fun. The reason I start with that is I honestly do think that's, that's a great illustration for a lot of times the Christian faith. How we all have these fears, right? And, and for me as a kid, I was scared of jumping off and then sharks, like they were silly. But we have these fears and those fears keep us from all that God intense. Like fear kept me from getting to enjoy the pool the same way my sister, family, older people did at the time. But once I was able to push through that, I had more fun than I can remember having. It was a blast. I think the same thing's true of faith. We allow fear to keep us in many ways from being faithful. That, that could be everything from fear of, of what your family thinks of you. That, that could be fear of well, what would my neighbor say if I spoke up? That can be fear of, well, hey, what would my community group think? That could be fear of, what will my non-believing family members think? That could be fear of, what will people at work think? That could be fear of a myriad of things. If, if I'm this faithful, if I'm that generous, who, who will take care of me? If I speak up now, what will they think of me, right? We allow fear to hold us back. And guys, it really keeps us from a life of courage, a life that's better lived. And as we're going to see from a passage today, we make this false trade. We choose fear 
when God offers instead power, love, and self-control. So that's what I want to spend our time talking about. So if you have a Bible, we are continuing our series through 2 Timothy. We are still in chapter 1, and we're going to look at just two verses. We're going to look at verses 6 and 7 out of chapter 1, where again, guys, we're specifically talking about how we have a courageous faith how we have a courageous faith. To give you a little context of of what's going on, the Apostle Paul, he's this big time church leader, missionary, wrote the majority of the New Testament. He is writing a letter from prison. It's a prison cell that he's gonna end up dying in. It's towards the very end of his life. He's writing a letter from prison to his mentee, this disciple that he raised up in the faith, Timothy. Timothy, he was this church pastor, church planner. He was a church leader. But he's going through a really hard time. Why? Because Christians everywhere were going through a really hard time. They were facing persecution and opposition and all these things were going against him. Paul's writing this letter to a young disciple that he loved, that he'd raised in the faith. And he's calling to him and he's saying, be courageous, be courageous, be courageous. The reason we're working our way through 2 Timothy, it's a letter written to a church leader to strengthen the faithfulness, strengthen leadership. If you're watching and you're gathering online, here's what's true. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are meant to be a church leader. The church, that's the people of God. You are meant to shepherd and care for the people of God. That's true of you, whether you embrace that reality of what God intends for your life or you deny that. The reason I wanna focus on this is if you're a follower of Christ, God wants you to be marked by courage. It leads to blessing. It's a better life. That's what we're going to show you through the passage. You don't want you marked by fear. So grab your Bible, read with me, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. I'm going to read them, and then we're going to work our way through as we talk about courageous leadership. Verse 6, for this reason, I remind you, so Paul, he's writing to Timothy, I remind you, that's Timothy, to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Guys, as we talk about courageous faith and what that looks like, first thing I wanna remind you guys is where we were last week. Right before this, Paul, he's connecting this dot as he's calling to courageous faith in Timothy. He's connecting the dot of Timothy, I know that you have faith and you've been faithful for a long time. He's calling back the idea of Timothy. He had a grandmother named Lois who was a faithful believer in Jesus Christ. He had a mother named Eunice who was a faithful believer in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, hey, in response from the faith that you've received, this faith lineage and family you have from them, for this reason, he calls Timothy to fan into flame the gift of God. Now, scholars, when it says the gift of God, they generally talk about two things and they connect it to the laying on of hands. Right? They, they generally put it in two categories. The first one being just the gift of salvation, of just belief. The realization that God in heaven loves Timothy, that he died for Timothy to forgive Timothy of his sins. And all he does is look at Timothy and say, believe this to be true. That's the first way. The second way scholars talk about it is, hey, are they speaking to a specific spiritual gift in the life of Timothy? Was there a gift that came from the laying on of hands here? Here's what I would share. I think contextually it's talking to the gift of faith. Later on context, and we'll talk about this in the coming weeks, it's gonna talk about guard the deposit entrusted to you, your belief in Jesus Christ. What Paul's pleading with Timothy is to fan faithfulness into flame. The language it uses there in verse six, fan into flame, your Bible, it may say it differently, to kindle. It's this idea of like, if you've ever built a fire and and then you know how a fire, it can grow big and it can roar, bring warmth and light to all in the room. And the second thing that can happen is if you don't nurture that fire, if you don't develop that fire, what can happen is it can diminish to where what's left over are just these embers. It's this idea of breathing on embers because what happens when you add oxygen to fire, it grows. Paul's telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, Be courageously faithful. Be courageously faithful. That's what we're going to see in verse 7. But how does he tell Timothy to do that? He says, hey, Timothy, you have to fan faithfulness into flame. You have to nurture it. You have to develop it. You have to grow it. 
The reason why I think that matters so much for so many of us is I really do believe Christians at times, we're very guilty, I can be guilty of this, of taking a passive approach towards faithfulness. What I mean by that is we just expect God to grow in us this courage, this faithfulness. We just hope that in the moment we'll be ready to speak the truth in love, share our faith when we're nervous, be generous even when we don't know how. Right? We, we just think that all of a sudden, even though we don't prepare, even though we don't train, even though we don't fan into flame, nurture and develop it, we'll just be ready. Paul's writing to Timothy and he's writing to you and me. No, no, no. Faith is a gift that you receive from God, but it's meant to be fanned into flame. If you want it to roar, if you want it to grow, feed it. Much the same you would nurture a fire. I can remember something that makes me think of this. Um, one of the things that we have a high value on here at the Springs is sharing our faith. And what I mean sharing our faith is, I mean personal evangelism. It's going up to strangers. It's going up to our neighbors. It's going up to our family members and saying things like, hey, do you mind me asking you a, a bit of a strange question? But do, do you happen to have a faith? Asking them, do you have a spirituality, belief system, anything like that? That is a value of ours at the Springs. That is something that is normative in the life of Christian believers. Why? Because we have the greatest message that has ever been given. We are meant to tell the world. See also the big narrative of 2 Timothy. Tell the world even when it's hard. But I, I can remember thinking about even this idea of you got to fan these things into flame, these gifts that God's given. Uh, staff, we took a Tuesday. Every Tuesday staff gathers. We call it, uh, it's a time of discipleship. We gather, we remind ourselves of what is right, it's true. We pray for you guys. We pray for one another. We took a Tuesday morning where I just looked at everybody and said, hey guys, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to break up. We're going to go out in groups of two and we're just going to go around the city and we're going to share our faith. Some folks went to coffee shops. Some folks went to H-E-B. Myself and another pastor on staff, M.K., we went and we walked some of the streets. I point over my shoulder on the other side of Walnut. We just went and walked down a couple streets, just knocking on doors, asking to share our faith. M.K., the reason I went with her, she is faithful. She's courageous. She is bold but she was totally nervous. She was worried the same way I get nervous. I got worried and I said, hey, MK, let me go with you. We went and we start and we had this deal. I said, hey, MK, we'll walk down this whole block. I'm gonna knock on every house on the right-hand side. You knock on every house on the left-hand side. So we go down, we knock on these doors. The first person, they don't answer. The second person, they answer. You try to share your faith. I can remember he said, oh yeah, I'm connected to a church. He just closed the door. He don't wanna talk anymore. We go to the next one. There we are. I'm trying to use broke in Spanish. He was so kind. We're sharing faith about Jesus Christ. We're inviting him to the Springs. MK's there. She's jumping in. She's sharing too. We're doing this in partnership. It was so fun. We go to the next house. No one's there. We go to the house after that. Someone's there. We get to have a conversation about faith. And we get down. I think it was six houses on the right side. We go to the other side. It's MK's turn. Now, MK, that entire time, she was willing. She wanted to be used by God. She's courageous. She's faithful. But there's still a timidity. There's a fear. And what did she have the opportunity to do? Fan it into flame. How did that start? She knocked on the first door. We wait, we wait, we wait. No one answers. We walk to the next house. She gets a chance to fan it into flame. She knocks on the second door. We wait, we wait, we wait. Now, MK, we walked down that whole block. Not a single person was home. So I think part of that was God was just trying to honestly like honor her in that to where even me as a leader, we ended up having to leave that location, go to another where there was a guaranteed spiritual conversation that she could have. Why? She wanted to fan that into flame. How, how do you grow in courageous faith? You build it. There's this idea biblically that courageous faith, it's earned. What, what I don't mean by that is you ever earn your salvation. That's not what I'm talking about. But being courageous in the moment, it, it's earned. And it's earned by the little moments of faithfulness that lead up to it. How do you be courageous in shepherding your community group when there's a hard topic that comes up? You discipline yourself to know God's word before. You listen in that moment when you feel that twinge in your stomach. You listen to the Holy Spirit and say, God, if you want me to say something, I will. And the third, you obey. That's how you fan that into flame. How do you come and rightly divide the word of truth? You discipline yourself to know the word of truth. You fan it into flame. How do you come and value intimacy with God over impurity with your boyfriend or your girlfriend? You fan into flame intimacy 
love in pursuit of God. You connect with others through community group. How, how do you fan into flame having a community group that you actually enjoy? You get to know them. You, you develop that. Do you see how these things don't just come passively to you? You fan it into flame. Courageous leadership is fanned into flame because here's what happens. This is what you see in verse seven. As you fan faithfulness into flame, as you grow in a love for God, you trade something, right? You trade fear, timidity, for power, love, and self-control. I'm going to read verse 7 again. Jumping back in. So coming out of fanning into flame, for God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. I love this, guys, because right here, what Paul's doing with Timothy, he's saying, hey, Timothy, Remind yourself of what you know to be true, your love for God. Remind yourself that he has come. He has set you free. Remind yourself that the worst thing that could ever happen to you is that you pass from this life into the next. Remind yourself of that. Fan it into flame, Timothy. And what does that do? It's how you begin to trade fear for power, for love and self-control. The word fear here, not in your Bible, but in extra biblical literature. So literature, first century, right around that same time, this word was used of cowards, specifically. It was used of someone who in the face of battle fled. It's speaking to this idea of we all have the potential for spiritual cowardice. It doesn't mean we hate God. It doesn't mean we don't love God. It doesn't mean we even wanted to do that. But we've all felt that moment, well, whether it's we go to share our faith or you go to have a hard conversation or, or you go to act in obedience yet you don't want to and so you don't. We've all had that moment. That's what he's saying, fear. But what removes that fear is you fan into flame faithful love of God. And what do you exchange it with? What do you exchange it with? Power. I love this because the word power here in Greek, it's got the same root word from where we get the word dynamite. It speaks to this explosive energy. Do you ever have this tendency to think that Christians were just supposed to be this feeble, weak, kind of insecure group of people who just walk around just quoting the Bible that are honestly ineffectual in culture? That is the absolute opposite of what God's calling for Timothy. Because you got to remember, Timothy's context, there's persecution from faith. He's wondering whether or not how many days he has left on this earth as people are coming after Christians. And Paul's saying, I know you're scared, Timothy. I know you're scared. But as you grow your faithfulness and your love for God, what do you find? Power. Let people see in you power. There's this quote by Billy Graham that talks about courage. It says, courage, it's contagious. That when one person stiffens their spine, stands up in courage, that what does it do to the others in the room? They stiffen their spine as well. You church leader, you follower of Christ are meant to be marked because you fanned into flame faith. You are meant to be marked by power. God wants to use you. He's not wanting to use you in a broken, insecure, fearful state. Because you're his, because it's his spirit that empowers it. He wants to use you in power. What else happens when you fan into fame, or fan into flame, excuse me, faith? You trade fear for love. I love that because it just speaks to the truth of what, what we know. As you get to know God, you grow in an understanding of how much he loves you. How much he loves you. I imagine as Paul wrote this, he's likely thinking about his own life. What was true of Paul, right? And this is just my imagination as I think this. What was true of Paul that we know for sure? He killed Christians, he persecuted the church, and then he has this miraculous conversion where he comes to know God. He grows his faith, he fans faith into flame, and what does he realize? Though Paul is capable of tremendous past hurt because he did, though he is presently often offensive and sinful, though Paul knew in his future he had brokenness and baggage, God looked at him and what did he feel? Love. That when he looked at Paul, he saw Paul and it was chosen, beloved, forgiven, free, mine. Guys, as you get to know the love of God, as you fan faith into flame, 
it creates courageous faithfulness because you understand the depth of how much you're loved. And you know what's true? When you understand how much you're loved, you know what you are? Far more loving. It's what changes marriages. It's what changes community groups. It's what changes the insecure to the strong, the weak to the dignified. Love. What's the third thing that happens when you fan into flame? You, you trade fear for self-control. It, it, your Bible may say self-discipline. It's speaking to the ability, which is a fruit of the Spirit, for self-restraint, which is what happens when you grow in faith. Like what faith always leads to is maturity. And in maturity, greater self-restraint. This is why so many Christians I see, right? Really maturing Christians. We don't come and flaunt the fact that, oh, we're fine and we've grown and we're doing so much better and we don't have problems. No, no, no. Mature Christianity is marked by a self-control that says, I have to bridle myself lest I run away. I have to take heed lest I fall. And what's amazing is, is you fan into flame faith. That happens. Who are some of the most courageous people in our culture right now? The people who choose holiness in the midst of the apparent absence of it. Courageous faith looks like getting on Netflix and saying, I'm not watching that. Courageous faith looks like going to the movie theater and saying, I'm not seeing that. Courageous faith looks like controlling yourself to when you turn on the news, you are not incited in anxiety and worry and fear because there's a dependency upon God. Self-control. Guys, Paul's writing this letter to a church leader. We are church leaders. I pray to God you embrace that call in your life. That's not just a call for me. That's not just a call for trustees. That's not just a call for staff. That's not just a call for community group leaders. That is a call for believers in Jesus Christ. If you're a member of the Springs, hear that. You are meant for courageous faithfulness. And when you do this, guys, it's a better life. I was so thankful today. I jumped off the diving board. I swam to the bottom. It's a better day. And all it took was courage. I'll close with this. This past week, I got to celebrate. I didn't know him personally. I'd heard of him. But I got to celebrate something that really, it, honestly, it surprised me. I saw this, uh, this post where people were celebrating a, a funeral of a Christian who'd passed away. They made this comment how there's going to be singing at the funeral because of this man's faithfulness, his legacy, everything he'd done in his life. The amazing testimony of God. The fact that he had faith in Christ. Now, what was true of this man is he was a church elder, a church planter, a church pastor down in Ecuador. Because of faithfulness in him, faithfulness had come to his family and faithfulness had come to his entire village. It, it was separated. And he had lived for decades in faithfulness, raising up other people, telling them about the goodness and the love of Jesus Christ, helping them to walk in accordance with God's word. He'd done that. That was his legacy. He had passed. He'd gone to be with Jesus Christ. And they do what Christians do at funerals. They sung. But what was amazing was when I really remembered and I realized what led to that moment. See, the man's name was Minkaye. Minkaye, he was a warrior in a village tribe in Ecuador. Many of you, perhaps if you grew up in church, you know the story of Jim Elliot. Jim Elliot was an evangelical missionary that went to Ecuador this unreached people group trying to bring them the gospel of Jesus Christ, the truth that God loves you. You're a sinner in need of a savior. And God does not want you to pay the penalty for your sins. So he took every ounce of just and righteous wrath that you and I deserved and he placed it on Jesus Christ. And it was Christ that bore the penalty for our sin. He died. Three days later though, he rose from the grave with victory in hand. And he looks at you and he looks at me and he says, believe this to be true. It sets you free. It allows forgiveness in your life, redemption, cleansing, wholeness, and health. It's this beautiful exchange. Jim Elliott, four friends, one of an unreached people group, a tribe in Ecuador to know that, and they had courageous faith to take it there. So much so, and, and the story's longer than this, so much so that there's eventually a point where they come and they bring it, and five of these missionaries lose their lives to warriors from this tribe. These warriors take their life. Minkaye was one of those warriors. He did not take the life of Jim Elliot, but he took the lives of two of the other missionaries. What happened following that moment is Minkaye and the other warriors of the tribe go back 
and then there's a funeral for those five faithful saints separate where families gather and they sang songs of worship. Do I imagine they grieved? Yes. Do I imagine that there were some people who were like, well, why did they have to go to Ecuador? Why did they have to do that? They didn't need to be that courageous. They didn't need to do that. And then there were two. Two faithful saints that not only sang at those funerals, but then took the legacy that they had seen, that courageous faith, and they embraced it themselves. That's Elizabeth Elliot. That was Jim Elliot's wife, as well as Rachel Saint, the wives of one of the men who lost his life. They went and they sang at those funerals. And then after that, they prayerfully and courageously, they went back to the tribe in Ecuador. And it was through their faithful advancing of the gospel. It was through their courageous faith that guess who came to know Jesus Christ? Minkaye. From that, guess who came to know Jesus Christ? Minkaye's family. Guess who came to know Jesus Christ through that? That tribe. Guys, what did that take? Did that meant there was never a moment of fear or timidity? No, but courageous faith comes and it stands beside the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who gave you his word to instruct you in the way of godliness and righteous. And it says, I have him, therefore, I will not live in fear. I will live in power. I will not live in fear. I will be marked by love. I will not live in fear. I will be known by self-control courageous faith. Guys, the reason I share that is you may not be called to Ecuador in the same way. Maybe some of you are, right? But we are all called to have courageous faith. There are people just like Minkaye that God in heaven wants to use you by the power of his grace to bring transformation in our life to where you go and courageous faith would lead to looking like you, sharing your faith with them. Even though you're scared, but if I tell them, what will they think about me? And then I'm the weird Christian. Who cares? Tell them the truth. Courageous faith looks like in the midst of fear, anxiety, and worry that marks the world rooting yourself in the truth that Jesus Christ loves you. He is sovereign. He is not surprised by COVID-19. That while he calls you to walk in wisdom, he never says to live in fear. Do you know that the command do not fear is used 365 times throughout your Bible? Christians are called to be courageous. Courageous faith looks like going and sharing with your community group when you know that there's honest sin that people just aren't addressing and talking about it lovingly, bringing it up, saying God would have us do better. It looks like you repenting of your lack of commitment in your marriage. It looks like you going to your girlfriend or your boyfriend when you know there's sexual impurity, repenting, asking forgiveness, inviting community to come in, set boundaries. It looks like you, even if you don't believe in Jesus and you're just wrestling with the whole thing, being courageous enough, even though you don't have the faith yet, to simply say, will someone come and have a conversation with me about this? Will someone come and talk with me about this? Church, you're a leader. We are meant to have a courageous faith. I want mine to grow. How does it grow? We fan it into flame. And as we fan it into flame, what happens? We're not marked by fear. You know, we're marked by power, love, self-control. There's a better life that awaits. I found that when I jumped off that diving board. We as a church, we are meant to find the better life that's on the other side of courageous faith. Let me pray that we would. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for what it does in my life. I thank you for what it does in the lives of all of us, God. I'm asking you to change hearts. Would you lead people to know you? Right, And then those who, who make that profession, God, have them reach out so we can disciple them, we can care for them, we can connect with them. Father, I'm praying for every person here who, who is a follower of you. Would you grow in them a courage? Would you use them? In a time where just like Timothy, he's facing opposition, we are facing opposition. May we be marked by a courage, not a cavalier bravado, but a courage that depends and is rooted on you. I need your help to do that. We need your help to do that. We thank you knowing you love to do that. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Guys, again, as I shared at the, top, at the start, below you'll see a phone number. This is the phone number for my colleague, Jonathan Dennis. Reach out, call him if we can help connect you in any way. You can also email us, info at springsnb.org. We want to do everything we can to serve and connect with you. We love you guys. Y'all go. Have a great week of worship. We'll see you soon.